I just want to go ahead and welcome everyone to our Survive and Thrive webinar series. We are glad to have you all with us today, and we're excited to hear from Samantha Cool, who's going to be discussing oncology safe skin care. So if you haven't heard about the Texas Oncology Foundation, it is a foundation um, that is dedicated to providing support to cancer patients in the communities where they live, work, and receive treatment. So through Survive and Thrive programming, the foundation is able to provide educational events and resources to both help build the community and connections to support all involved in the cancer journey. We are recording this webinar and it will be on our online archive and we'll be able to be for viewing um, anytime after Thursday this week. So make sure that you go to our Texas Oncology Foundation website, you hit the programs tab, and then the Survive and Thrive webinar archive on the left of our website. So now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. She's going to be sharing her screen with us. Her name is Samantha Cool. She's a licensed esthetician and the owner of Seva Face and Body. Samantha, go ahead and take it away for us. So hello to you all. Um, I am thrilled to be speaking with you today. I know a whole lot more about oncology safe skin care than I do about computers, obviously. Um, but I am here today to help you kind of debunk the myths and understand oncology safe skin care, what it's for, what it is, how to use it. Um, and hopefully uh, that will help you avoid any kind of uh, irritating or um, long-term effects because of your skin and the condition of your skin while you're going through cancer or cancer treatment. So with that, we'll get started. And again, the topic is understanding oncology safe skin care for the face and body. So what you should know um, about cancer and the treatments for cancer, cancer and treatments for cancer can cause skin irritation and sensitivity. Um, I spend most of my time working with people that are going through chemo, radiation, targeted therapies, um, surgeries, and there's a consistency to the types of um, irritations and problems that come up with different categories of treatments. But the one thing that is always the case is that for the most part, the skin does get irritated and it does get reactive uh, when you're going through treatment of any kind. So the biggest issue with that, and it's not terribly common, but it is a possibility, and it's why skincare is so important, is irritation and sensitivity um, with the skin or on the skin can cause microscopic tears um, to occur. And unfortunately, when you have tears in the skin at any point in time, you can invite infection into the body, which is obviously not something that we, we ever want. So the condition of your skin is incredibly important. You wanna keep it supple, you wanna keep it in good shape so that you can avoid any kind of tears that may cause infection. Um, so consistent and intentional skincare practices can help prevent and treat issues with the skin. So all is not lost. Um, it's, it's simply knowing that you need to think about your skin and that you need to work towards helping your skin stay supple and keeping the skin barrier intact. So the focus of oncology safe skin care is the most important thing that I like to share with people. Um, it's a complete mind shift for most of us because when we reach a certain age, if not before that, we have agendas when it relates to our skin, right? We're either trying to um, provide anti-aging solutions, we're trying to take care of pigmentation issues, um, we're trying to get rid of puffiness under the eyes. There's so many things that we are trying actively to do with our skin and for our skin. And the focus is very different than when you're going through treatment. So when you're going through treatment, you're trying to protect your skin. You're trying to hydrate your skin. You're trying to soothe your skin and calm your skin and ultimately love your skin um, because the skin is the largest organ that we have. Um, in and on our body. And we need our skin to protect everything that is going on inside our body underneath our skin. So changing your mental focus of how you take care of your skin um, during and after cancer treatment is very, very important. And it's as much mental as it is anything else. So some home care do's and don'ts of skincare. A lot of these are just common sense, um, but certainly worth going over. So do use your hands, meaning that for cleansing your face, for cleansing your body, 
it's much better to use your hands as opposed to anything that might be aggressive or rough on your skin. A lot of people use loofahs. Um, a lot of people use scrubs. A lot of people use handheld devices like Clarisonics and Foreos. Those types of things are not good for sensitive skin because they help promote that kind of uh, compromised skin that is, is uh, basically able to tear more easily than when your skin is in good uh, condition and not compromised. So I encourage everyone to use their hands for cleansing, for product application, um, anything like that. You wanna use tepid, temperatured water, not hot water, which is um, difficult for most of us who like really, really hot water, but hot water will dry out your skin really fast. And of course, when your skin is dry, then it's more prone to, to tearing and uh, to being irritated. Along with that, do take short showers and baths. So a lot of us, myself included, I like to take a really hot bath and I like to soak in it for a really long time. And that is uh, a luxury for some of us that if going through cancer or cancer treatment, we, we can't do. Um, again, the heat dries out the skin and excessive uh, use of water or submerging in water will also ultimately dry out your skin. So keep your baths and showers short, keep the water temperature tepid, and you'll do very well. Um, as far as products, you wanna use oncology safe products whenever possible. A lot of oncology safe products are what I call multi-use products. So one product may be able to cleanse your body. It may also be able to cleanse your face. It may also be able to wash your hair. So that's what I mean about multi-use products. And we'll talk a little bit later about uh, options out there for, for product lines. So the next one is focusing on products that support the skin barrier. And we've talked a little bit about that, but emollient products that are, when, when I say emollient products, think about the, the texture of something like a Vaseline. So products that are very thick, that create a, um, a protective barrier for the skin are really, really good for keeping in moisture and retaining whatever hydration and moisture your skin has naturally. So products that support the skin barrier are very, very important. Do use a gentle cleanser. We talked a little bit about that. Do not use any scrubs. A lot of people like to scrub their skin for uh, exfoliation purposes. And a lot of scrubs out there, depending on what the scrub portion is made of or the ingredients are, a lot of scrubs are very, very harsh on the skin. And they will also create microscopic tears in the skin. Um, and we've talked a lot about how that's, that's not a good idea. So uh, all in all, I just recommend that people do not use scrubs and there are some oncology safe scrubs and I'm happy to answer any questions about that. But for the most part, what you get in the store or what you get from expensive skincare lines, they are not going to be oncology safe or oncology considerate. So I just say it's better to stay away from them, period. Um, taking frequent and short showers and baths. We talked a little bit about that already and using, oops, sorry, uh, emollient moisturizers to prevent irritation is very important. You want to make sure there's no perfume or alcohol in anything that you are putting on your skin. The next topic is UPF 50 clothing and hats. So UPF is a um, protection factor that is built into the fabric of clothing and hats. And what that does is it gives you an added layer of protection from the sun and it keeps you from having to slather yourself in sunscreen all day long, every two to three hours. So I am a, a huge fan of UPF um, clothing and hats, so much so that I actually uh, wrap a line. I'm a wholesaler for a medical uh, UPF clothing and hat company. And so I have access to all of those items. If you have any interest in talking more or learning more about them or seeing them, just um, certainly reach out and I'm happy to, to go over any of that with you. But UPF 50 clothing and hats, very, very important. It's a tremendous way to help yourself stay protected from the sun. And you're always, of course, going to apply sunscreen, uh, SPF 30 and up. You want to make sure that it's a physical sunscreen, um, which means that it creates a physical barrier from the sun. It's not a chemical product. Uh, it will say right on the sunscreen that you're looking at, whether it's physical or whether um, 
it is a chemical sunscreen. So you want to make sure that you're applying a physical sunscreen SPF 30 and up. And the recommendation is every two to three hours, if you're in the sun, you want to reapply that sunscreen. So moisturizing your skin is so, so important. I don't think we can talk about it enough. Um, some people will ask me how many times a day do I have to moisturize? There is no right or wrong answer. It's really about your skin and how quickly it soaks up the moisturizer that you are using. So if it's twice a day, great. If it's three times a day, that's up to you to determine. Only you know what your skin needs. But if you know what your skin feels like when it's dry, make sure that to the best of your ability, you never let it get dry. So moisturize as often as you need to. Um, emol emollient moisturizers stop water loss in the skin by creating a protective layer on the skin. So I'm restating that again. Make sure that the moisturizer that you use is very emollient and is able to protect your, your skin from losing any more of its natural um, hydration. Bath oils, soap substitutes, and moisturizers can all be emollients. So if you think about that, that gives you more than one opportunity to use emollient products on your skin. Bath oils, um, anything like a milk bath, sub soap substitutes can be foaming cleansers. They can be gel-based cleansers. Um, moisturizers come in all shapes and sizes. There are a lot out there that are very heavy and very emollient. And if you use emollient bath oils, soap substitutes, and moisturizers, as an example, you're getting a trifecta um, of emollient moisturizer on your body, and that will only serve to help you. So just think about it from the standpoint of anything you're using on your skin. If there is an emollient option for that product, you want to use it. Twice a day or as needed. We sort of covered that already, but basically as much as you need, as often as you need, make sure that you are moisturizing your skin. You can moisturize for your actual skin condition, um, and that may change. Obviously, uh, during the time of the year, there are different seasons that change the moisture level in your skin. Depending on what you may be going through health-wise, that can also change. Uh, genetics play a big role in it, but you want to use a moisturizer. Oh, excuse me. I think I've got a spelling error there. Sorry about that. Um, use a moisturizer that you can apply easily like a cream or a lotion if your skin is in what you would consider good condition. If you are dry or flaky, look for a heavier, more emollient moisturizer, and you're going to use that with more frequency. If you are dry or scaly, use a moisturizing soap substitute and then an emollient moisturizer. So you're putting in another layer. If you feel like your skin is dry and scaly, you're making sure that whatever you're cleansing with also has a moisturizing component. And then overnight application. Um, this is especially helpful if you've got problems with your hands or your feet and they are so dry that you cannot um, seem to get enough moisture on them. What you wanna do is, as an example, you can purchase some gloves, uh, mittens for the hands and sort of socks for the feet. They also have hand, uh, gloves for the hands where you actually moisturize and hydrate with something very, very thick and very occlusive. You put the gloves on your hands or the socks on your feet, whichever, and you sleep in that overnight. And what happens is your natural body heat um, creates a much more welcome environment for that product to actually seep in and to work. And also, obviously, you don't lose it to uh, your bedding or anything that you might be wearing um, because it's all held in and against your skin by the socks or the gloves or the mittens. So that's a good idea for hands and feet. Home care don'ts we talked about again, we'll go over these. Don't use hot water, don't take long showers, don't use abrasive products and tools, don't use products with alcohol or fragrance, don't cause friction on the skin, that's a big one. And of course, don't forget about sun protection. Can't overstate that. So here are some resources for you. This is in no way an exhaustive list, um, but it's just a, a short list for you to look into if you're interested. Um, and I am happy I can go into more detail on any of these lines as well. Um, but options for skincare. Hale & Hush is a company that is known for making oncology safe skincare. 
That is a very simple line. They don't have a lot of products in that line. Um, most of the products in the line are multi-use, as we talked about earlier. And they are uh, what I would call a reasonably priced line. So Hale & Hesh is really good. Anything calendula-based um, that you can find as a skincare product line for the most part is also going to be good. And there are so many out there. If you have a question about a particular calendula based product or products, you're more than welcome to reach out to me and I'll tell you what I know about them. Um, Onda is another organic and natural skincare line. It's also like Hale and Hush. It was uh, created by a lady whose daughter had a very aggressive form of cancer and was having some serious skin problems. And she decided that out of love for her daughter and um, for people that were dealing with similar issues that she would create a skincare line. So she did, and it is a fantastic line. Uh, My Girl Skincare, that is also an oncology safe line. And they came into the world based on uh, an owner who also had breast cancer, who was dealing with terrible skin issues um, during radiation. And so she created a skincare line called My Girls, which she's expanded into a number of different products. She started out with only one, which was a radiation cream, but now she has radiation cream. She has radiation butters if you need something more thick. She's got sprays if you can't stand to put a, uh, a lotion on your skin and all kinds of just really innovative uh, products for radiation primarily. Um, and then also I would say the second secondary benefit to her products is that they're incredibly healing, soothing, emollient, all of the words that you've heard me use. And so you can use them over the rest of your body as well as areas where you might be getting radiated. Um, next, I have CeraVe, Eucerin, Aquaphor. Those are all things that, you know, if you are um, looking to purchase something at a pharmacy or somewhere where things are more readily acceptable. Those are lines that have been known and proven to be sensitive. They are not necessarily oncology specific, um, but you'll notice that a lot of doctors will recommend them or give away samples. And that's simply because they're easy to come by, they're accessible, and they will not cause you any harm or discomfort. Um, the flip side, and, and you know, from what I've learned and what I understand is they don't necessarily do anything to rebuild. They're more about um, hydrating and moisturizing and making sure that you don't have any reactivity. So good option. They just don't have as many active um, benefits as some of the other, other lines that are oncology specific. And then dermavigils, this is a little bit of a different topic. This is image recovery based. So I see a lot of people that come in and they're having issues with pigment changes in their skin or on their skin and uh, maybe uneven skin tone. Maybe their skin is changing colors based on the treatment that they're going through. Maybe it's they're feeling a little bit like their skin is ashen. Um, and so Dermavigils is all about providing products that help people with image recovery and they are oncology considerate products. And so they have more in the way of uh, makeup and SPFs that have some tint to them and powders and that sort of thing. So that is also a good line to look into if you are having issues with your, your image as you see yourself and would like to have a little bit um, of an option as far as what you can do to, to make those, those things better. And then lastly, Thrive Cosmetics. They are a line that um, is known to be very, very sensitive. They do a lot in the community as far as gifting products and fundraising for the cancer community. And their products um, are oncology sensitive and they're, excuse me, they are mainly a makeup line. They do have some skincare items, but they are mainly a makeup line. So again, just like Dermavigils, if you're looking to affect some change um, with your image, Thrive Cosmetics is another good option to look at. And then food for thought, um, and this is just, you know, restating something that we talked about in the very beginning of this presentation, but taking care of skin affected by cancer requires a gentle touch, consistency, and a mind shift from using overly active products to using healing, soothing, nourishing products and ingredients that will maintain or rebuild your skin barrier. So that in a nutshell is really what 
uh, oncology safe skincare is about. It's not necessarily that there is one right product or one right person to help you or uh, you know, one or two right things to do every single day that will get you to the point where your skin will be in great condition. It's more about realizing that your skin um, is really, really important to what's going on inside your body. And so just making sure that your skin is in the best condition it can be, that it's, um, we have a balance of proteins, lipids, and fats that make up our, our, um, our skin, basically, our skin barrier. And when those three things get out of whack, then we start to see complications with our skin. And what happens with cancer treatment, radiation, um, chemotherapy, targeted therapies, um, surgeries, is that all of that can create an imbalance in the proteins, lipids, and fats that make up your skin barrier. So if you're going through treatment and you think, oh my gosh, my skin is it's getting really red, it's very dry, it's starting to itch, and then you're scratching it because it's itchy, which would be natural. Um, the first thing you have to realize is that you're there, there's something out of balance there with the surface of your skin and that there are options available to you to replenish those things in your skin, but you have to be diligent with it and you have to be aware of it and you have to want to do something about it. Um, so you can do those things yourself, obviously. You can come and visit somebody like me who does oncology safe skincare. Um, anybody that is oncology trained is a good option. And basically what we do, just so you know, is we do facials, we do body treatments, we do things like hand and foot specialty treatments. Um, we might do scalp treatments. I tend to see people that have lost their hair and um, their scalp is feeling very sensitive, um, very dry and very itchy. And so for somebody like that, I would do um, a, a scalp treatment to try to get that skin back to um, its rightful state and stop all of those irritations. And so anything really relating to the skin, um, if you are interested in talking to somebody from a consultation standpoint, an oncology safe esthetician would be willing to do that with you um, just to kind of get you on the right track or answer any questions you might have. So um, I am here in Austin. I work for Cancer Rehab and Integrative Medicine on Spicewood Springs. I also have my own location, which is Save a Face and Body on Anderson Lane. Um, I do a lot of virtual work and I'm also mobile. So if that information is helpful to any of you all, um, be more than happy to chat with you about what's going on with your skin. Um, but with that, I am going to wrap up my presentation. And if there's anything else that I can uh, help with or answer questions for, happy to do so. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Samantha. That was very informational and it helped us kind of understand what um, oncology safe skincare is. So we are going to open this up to questions. You can be as specific as you'd like. We won't be using any names or anything, um, but please let us know if you have any questions. And Samantha, I do have a couple of questions after going through this. Do you want to continue sharing your screen or do you want to exit out? And then just hit escape and then stop share. There we go. Perfect. So um, yeah, so one question that I had was, um, kind of towards the middle of your presentation, you were talking about how sometimes they can moisturize, but they won't rebuild. What are some things that people should look for in order in a um, oncology safe skincare that will show that it can rebuild the skin cells? So um, what we're trying to do when we rebuild is we're trying to rebuild the balance of proteins, lipids, and fats in the skin, right? Mm -hmm. So there are products, um, as an example, I have a product called Vital Lipid Lotion. And so Vital Lipid Lotion is chocked full of lipids, um, hyaluronic acid, which is really, I mean, it doesn't sound like it would be hydrating, but it's terribly hydrating and very emollient um, and something that it's an ingredient in, in most all compromised skincare products. And um, jojoba oils or wax esters are fantastic also for anybody that's looking to rebuild that skin barrier. And so, you know, any any and all of those types of things are helpful. Okay, so I'm hearing like some jojoba oil and um, you said wax, what? 
So jojoba, and I should correct myself, this is so easily done, but we all want to say jojoba oil. Actually, jojoba is not an oil. It's a wax ester. And um, that's just a different product, right? It's a different ingredient than, than what a, a, uh, an oil would be made up of. But jojoba is one of the main products in a lot of healing uh, creams and cleansers and also calendula. So anything that has both of those things um, in them or one or the other is going to be a good start. Um, and I do have some people interested in, do you have a website? Can I type that in the chat for them? Yes, yeah, sure. My website is savafaceandbody.com. I have that in the chat for everybody. That's perfect. Um, and then I do have a question from one of our survivors is how do you identify oncology safe skincare providers? How do you know if somebody's legit? Uh, well, if they are legit, they would have gone through a certifying program. They should have a certificate. Okay. Uh, it should be hanging in their space right next to their uh, TDLR you know, license or whatever state they're in. But yes, they should be certified and be able to show you that they have gone through the training. Is this something that they can ask their doctor about, or is it something that they would just have to Google on their own? So the that's a whole nother webinar that we don't have time for. Okay. <laughs> exactly. um, typically, doctors are uh, very disinterested in oncology safe skincare is what right. I've found. They are busy trying to save people's lives. Yeah. And when you start talking about skincare, they kind of, their eyes just kind of glaze over and they're like, oh yes, that go and talk to my nurse about that. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say if anybody were able to share that information, it would be a nurse practitioner. Okay or a patient navigator, typically they will have those sorts of resources, but Google works really well as also. And then just making sure that they ask for that certificate, that oncology safe skincare certificate. Yes, I think that anytime, I mean, I don't typically have people ask me, but when they walk into my space, it's very apparent that all my products are oncology safe and, you know, that I, I do things a little bit differently um, and and in the, the way that we do our intake and what we talk about as far as medications and treatments and all of those things, uh, it's a different process. And so you either come in and experience it and realize that, yes, this is in fact a different process and it's very oncology based, or before you get there, you ask somebody if you can see their certificate or if they have one or where they got their training. There's only three companies in the country actually that train in oncology safe aesthetics. I'm just switching gears a little bit. I do have um, another survivor that is using an immunology drug and the skin on their arms and bruises, like it just bruises very easily. So is there any like additional products that would be specific to a condition like that? Um, the bruising is not something necessarily that products will uh, affect. Uh, okay. The condition of the skin can be positively impacted by products. The bruising is 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 sub, right? It's under under the skin. And so unfortunately not. That's just something that usually takes time uh, to go away. Okay, that's good to know. So there's some like work that you can do to kind of keep your skin moisturized, but there's nothing that's going to help that subsurface for the bruising. There's not, not that I'm aware of. Now we, you know, the, where I um, practice here in town, which is cancer rehab and integrative medicine once a week, I'm there. They have so many different therapists that are oncology certified and trained in a lot of different areas. So there are people there that do, um, physical therapy, uh, massage, there's regular lymphatic massage. There are people there that do acupuncture, people there that do all kinds of classes and nutrition and all of that. So I would certainly refer people to cancer rehab and integrative medicine for anything out of the norm um, like that, that has to do with oncology and see about potential options for therapists. Um, okay, so we did have another question. Um, what should survivors do if they wash their hands a bunch and just can't seem to keep moisturizers on? So my, my thought on that is to get a pair of very, very soft gloves um, and to wear those gloves every night when you sleep, all night. You're, you're going to go ahead and moisturize your hands. Um, then you're going to put the soft gloves on. You're going to sleep in them. And then during the day, you want to make sure that you are 
as much as you can doing the same thing, keeping your hands covered. Make sure that you've always got SPF on your hands because the sun will obviously exacerbate that condition. And then keep them out of the water um, as much as you can. And if you have to put your hands in water, make sure you've got gloves on that are waterproof. Okay. Okay. And then we have another question as well. Um, we have a survivor asking, what about shampoos? I'm afraid to wash my hair because it breaks so easily. Yes. Um, so what I would say about shampoos is that there are products that are oncology considerate okay. that you can use to wash your body and also to wash your hair. So this, it's, you know, it's kind of a one size fits all uh, cleanser. And those types of products are very, very, very gentle. They're akin to what you might use on a baby uh, or an infant. And so that was one of the things we talked about earlier in the presentation was trying to trying to find multi-use products, yeah. uh, not because I'm trying to sell my product, but as an example, I have a cleanser. The cleanser that I use can be used to wash the body, wash the scalp um, or the hair, shave your legs with if you need to. Um, it is multi-use and it's very gentle. So anything like that is a really good idea. And then um, I know you mentioned maybe something that you would use on an infant, but what are some prop or some um, ingredients that they need to look out for that it should include or maybe that it shouldn't include? Well, it's more about what it what it should not include. So okay. um, anything that's got fragrance, mm -hmm. anything that's got alcohol, anything that has any kind of exfoliant in it, those are all um, red flags because those are all things that will either dry out your skin or possibly tear your skin and that being more along the lines of the, the scrub or the exfoliant, um, you know, on a fairly regular basis. So just try to avoid those. Yeah. And then um, this is from my own curiosity. You mentioned doing a um, service for people who have lost their hair to cancer. Can you kind of walk us through what that looks like and what that service provides? Sure. So what I was referring to is what I call my scalp treatment. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes in to see me and they've got their, their, they've lost their hair, usually they are complaining about itchiness or just soreness, right? Soreness on the scalp because it's painful sometimes when the hair falls out. And so what I like to do with that is I like to use jojoba and I like to use warm towels. Um, I like to do a light scalp massage. I like to do a mask treatment on the scalp, very similar to what I would do on the face. Um, leave that on for hydration. And then go back over with warm towels, remove the product. And then finally, I, uh, I finish up with a Hoba uh, scalp massage and I send my clients home with their own bottle of Hoba so that they can continue to do that at home. Hmm. Awesome. I'm going to give the chat a moment to um, ask any questions. And we just had one pop up. So the next question is, are there any hair conditioners that are oncology safe that you know of? Um, there are hair conditioners that are safe. And, and what I should probably do is talk a little bit about the EWG, which okay. is the Environmental Working Group. So EWG is uh, an app, most easily accessed through their app. And they're called the Environmental Working Group. And what they do is lobby and go out and learn and research um, products. And then they grade them based on different, um, different types of components. So you know, this particular deodorant has a 50% or higher chance of giving somebody, you know, XYZ type of cancer or whatever the situation might be. And there's lots of different categories for each product. So what I always tell people is if you're using um, products and you're curious to see how they, how they rate, um, download the EWG app, Environmental Working Group. And see if your product is there. It'll give you more information, honestly, than um, you probably would ever want. And you may end up going down a big rabbit hole once you start reading it. Um, but it's good to know that it's there. And then you can get specifics about the products that you're currently using. So just kind of going back to the scalp treatment, we have a survivor asking, what is the product used on the scalp treatment? So I know you said jojoba, but um, maybe they're asking for the specific facial or the yes. what you use for the facial. Yes, yeah. So what I use in my scalp treatment is it's called quiet wash. Um, and then I go back and I use a uh, cooling mask, which is through one of the lines that I carry. 
And so um, once the cooling mask is removed, once the scalp is, well, let me back up. Once the scalp has been washed and the cooling mask has been applied, massaged in and removed, then the aftercare product or the last thing that goes on is the emollient hydrator, which is the jojoba. And that's used for massage. we're going to wait a little bit for people to catch up on the chat again, ask any questions. They can be as specific or broad as you would like them to be. Um, and we'll wait for that for a moment. Samantha, I have a question. I was wondering, what is your most um, asked for pr procedure that you do or asked for like facial that you do for your work? So there are two treatments that I do most frequently. Um, one is what I just call my gentle facial. So that's a 60 minute facial. It is designed for the client specifically. So it has stages to it, but it's modified based on who I'm seeing, what kind of medication they're on, what kind of reactivity they're having. And so it's really just a customizable treatment for the face. And then the second um, most requested product is called, it's a body hydration. So somebody might come in and say, I am just dry all over, you know, based on whatever their, their treatment protocol has been. I, I just need somebody to help me with my entire body, basically. Now, by my um, aesthetics license, I am limited to what areas of the body that I can actually touch. Um, but for that treatment, what I do is I do a very light dry brushing um, and then I do a full body hydration and um, moisturizing treatment with light massage work. I can see why that one is most requested. <laughs> okay, so we have a couple more questions. Um, one of the survivors watching says, my feet are very sensitive to most socks. What would you recommend as like that soft glove or soft sock that you were suggesting earlier? Is it, uh, is this specific to the toes or is this the whole foot? I would say that my feet are very sensitive. So I'm going to assume it's the whole foot. Okay. Um, I think what I would recommend is that depending on, I mean, if you, if you have to wear socks, um, I would recommend some very thin socks that have more cotton in them than anything else. I don't have a brand of sock that I would necessarily recommend, but I think when you're looking for the tree, the, when you're looking for the sock itself, you're gonna wanna look at what it's made of and the, the biggest or largest portion of that should be cotton. Okay, and then I think you mentioned wearing it to bed in the evening and yes. maybe like having like a soft, soft, um, um, I'm sorry, a soft material. So that would be like, you're saying mainly cotton is going to be the softest. So that, so that what I was just talking about was just for day to day. Okay. Um, but if somebody is sleeping or when somebody is sleeping, it, that's a wonderful opportunity to get just, you know, they sell those, um, those large kind of really soft socks, um, that you just imagine you're not putting a shoe over those socks. You're just wearing them around the house or when you're on the couch or whatever it is, but they're very, very soft and fluffy. And I would just get a pair of those myself. Um, and I would make sure that you have hydrated your feet with something very emollient. Um, again, we're talking about something with the texture of like a Vaseline okay. and then you pull the socks over and then you go to sleep in the socks and the heat from your feet helps that whatever product you've got on there kind of soak in and it will it will help you keep your feet moisturized uh, for you know during the daytime when you can't actually do that. So doing that on a regular basis is a great idea. Um, okay, so this is a good question. Um, we do have a couple of people asking how to contact you regarding the complimentary consultation for viewers. Is the best way to do that through your website or is there a better way? Um, probably just my email. So my email is saveafaceandbody at gmail.com. Let me put that in the chat really quickly. Okay. All right. And then the next question that I have is, are there differences in treatments for women of color? And are you experienced with this clientele? 
So if I were a regular esthetician, um, I would say that the answer to that is yes, because if I'm a, if I'm a regular esthetician, not specializing in oncology, I'm working with people that are usually looking towards some sort of, they've either got an acne focus or an anti-aging focus or uh, overly dry skin focus, sensitized, you know, could be any of those things and more. Mm-hmm. And they're looking for active ingredients that are going to create change in their skin. If that's the person that I'm working with, and that is a person of color, there are considerations that I need to make as far as the ingredients that are in the products that I want to use. Um, but if I'm working in the oncology space with a person who is of color, the skin in that situation is not looked at or treated any differently than any other skin because it's going to be sensitized skin, it's going to be dry skin, and there's nothing harsh that I'm going to use regardless of the ethnicity of the person that I'm seeing. So everybody's going to be treated the same. Yeah. So it sounds like you're versed in like regular, um, not oncology for different colors and you understand the chemicals that can affect that different colors of skin. But when it comes to oncology, everyone is kind of put on a base of like, okay, we need to make sure that none of these chemicals are present. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. It it is a completely different world when it comes to skincare. Okay. Cool. Um, We're going to take about five more questions. Um, We do have about 15 minutes. So just to give you guys a heads up. Um, I think this is a really good one. So what are your feelings on Botox and fillers when it comes to safety for a cancer survivor? I would run as far from that um, as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. I I don't know how much more clear I can be. When I talk about, you know, the, the whole thing with oncology, skincare is changing your mindset. And that's exactly what I'm, I'm saying without actually saying it. You know, most of us, when we are not dealing with cancer, are on some sort of agenda with our skin. We either want to look younger, we want our skin to be brighter, we want it to be tighter, and we're looking at all kinds of what I call invasive procedures to reach our goals. And when you are dealing with cancer, going through cancer treatment, that has to be put to the side, because what people don't realize is if your skin is compromised enough and you create tears in the skin, you can invite infection into the body. And I can't stress the importance of that. If you invite infection into your body and you you are all of a sudden dealing with infection in your system, I mean, it can get to the point where your medical team can stop your treatment, right? Mm-hmm. Just to take care of that, to bring you back to sort of ground zero where everything's working as it should. So whether it's Botox, whether it's plastic surgery, whether it's uh, peels, I, I'm just, uh, unfortunately, I'm totally against it because I just don't think it's the right path for your skin while you're going through treatment. Okay, I can see that. Is there any difference advice you'd give if you're post-treatment? Um, post-treatment is, is obviously different. Now, some people experience conditions with their skin for years after treatment ends. And so depending on where your skin is, if you feel that your skin is back to a position of normalcy and it's behaving the way you recognize that it should, um, by all means, if you're out of treatment and your doctor has cleared you, do whatever it is that you feel like doing. Um, So I do have another question. My face, this survivor says that their face has broken out in tiny little bumps, especially on their forehead and around their mouth. And they feel like they need to use a scrub or a gentle scrub in order to help with this. But right now it's not really affecting or making it better. Do you have any suggestions for someone who might be having these little bumps or breakouts around their mouth and forehead? Is the person in active treatment? Oh, good question. Let's answer as if they are and then as if they're not. Okay. So if you are in active treatment, um, it's important to understand what those little bumps are. So um, you could be having some perioral, perioral, excuse me, dermatitis. Um, You could be having just uh, some sort of no-name rash response to some of your medications Um, or treatment. So understanding what is actually causing the rash is very important before you use any kind of exfoliant to try to get rid of the rash. 
Um, in a lot of cases, if it's a rash that's happening while you're going through treatment, your doctors are going to prescribe something topical um, that, that will have some sort of active ingredient in it to, to, to help you treat that rash. Okay. So you really need to know what is causing the rash. Um, if you're out of treatment and that condition is occurring, then that's a whole different ballgame. You can certainly try a gentle scrub. Um, but I mean, usually rash is a sign of irritation and mm -hmm. scrubs don't typically um, clear irritation unless it's acneic. Mm, okay. I can see that maybe the scrub is making it even more irritated. Absolutely. It can. Okay. Just making sure I'm hearing you right. <laughs> Um, okay, so I do have another question. I'm going to just do um, generic radiation scars, and then I'm going to ask the survivor-specific question, but kind of wondering, they're having like radiation scars that are constantly irritated. What should they put on their scars, or what should they do for that scenario? Uh, is the skin broken, or is it intact and it's just irritated? Let me double check. Hold on. Um, I don't have that specific, so we can wait a second to see if they uh, want to disclose that, if it's well, specific or not. I can also answer based on kind of either or. So okay. um, if your skin, if the skin that's irritated is broken, mm -hmm. at that point, it becomes a wound, okay. technically, right? So if the yeah. skin is broken, you want to go to your medical team and say, here's what I've got going on. They will prescribe some sort of lotion or gel or topical um, to help that skin heal up. Now, if your skin is not broken and it's just irritated, then I am a fan of, again, of organic jojoba. I think that's really, really helpful. Uh, what's helpful with application too sometimes is using a brush, like a makeup, uh, a makeup brush or a mask brush to apply whatever the product is over that area instead of using your hands, because it can tend to be a little bit more gentle depending on what's going on there with the skin. And then does that advice change if it's in a really sensitive area? Like I'm thinking your genitals, your breasts, or anywhere um, in your genitals or armpits are just places that get a lot of movement. Is that advice change at all? Um, I think that it, the advice doesn't change at all, but it would be my thought that if somebody had an irritation like that um, in, a, in an area that was more private, that got more friction, more heat, all of that, that you would more than likely go to your medical team for that, okay. just because that skin has more of a chance of, of being compromised. Got it. Okay. That's great advice. I think that um, is what we need to hear sometimes is that it's okay to speak up for your own and advocate for yourself when you're having these issues. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, we have a couple of just kind of general questions that we'll end with. Um, one of them is, do you know how safe the lotion is most massage therapists use? Because we do know um, that a few survivors or cancer survivors like to get massages to relax or do lymphoma massages. So we're just trying to figure out if the lotion, the most common lotion that people use is safe or oncology safe. Well, that's a really good question. And I unfortunately don't know what the lotion is that most um, massage therapists use. I will say this though, I would feel confident if it was me, I would feel confident going to somebody that was a certified or licensed uh, lymphedema massage therapist okay. or that had any kind of certification that was oncology based and did massage work because part of their certification is going to be understanding what they can and can't put on the skin. Okay. Um, so make sure that if you're, you know, if you're in active treatment or you're just coming out of treatment like that up to nine months after you come out of treatment, you want to be just cognizant and um, considerate of what you're doing with your skin. Yeah. So just make sure that whoever you go to see is licensed in oncology on some level. Okay. So I think it's, again, just kind of speaking up for yourself and being like, okay, I'm making sure that um, this person is licensed properly. Yes. Okay. And then also knowing, um, I really like that website that you gave us earlier too, of being able to look that up and just seeing what um, the data is on different products is really neat as well. 
the EWG. The EWG, yeah. <laughs> no, it's really good. The only thing that I would caution people about with EWG, if you're anything like me, I mean, I started going down that the first time I was uh, told about it, and it was mm -hmm. hours. Oh, and I got re I went down all these different rabbit holes, and when I came out from from that darkness that I was in, mm -hmm. um, I couldn't make heads or tails of what I had just seen because it's so much. Yeah. So what I like to tell people is don't just mindlessly peruse that site. Go looking specifically for what your product is that you have questions about because it can become really overwhelming. Okay, last question. Um, this one's kind of more like summertime. I had someone ask if you can, after one of your treatments or after one of your facials, are you able to swim after? And then I had another person ask, they're kind of combined, so I'm going to just combine them together. Is chlorine in pools safe for cancer patients? So those are kind of side by side of are they able to go into the pool after one of their facials or anything like that or um, is chlorine pool generally safe for cancer patients so a um if somebody is going through treatment and they come in to have a facial there's nothing to say that they can't go swimming after that except i usually ask people and it depends on you know how soon or how late you're talking but i usually ask people not to do anything with their skin for 24 hours after treatment just to let all the products soak in, just to let everything work. Um, but you know, that's that's somebody, that's their own call. Okay. The person themselves, as far as chlorine, chlorine for people going through um, cancer and cancer treatment is just more aggressive than it is for somebody who's not. For any of us at any time, chlorine's not great for our skin. Yeah. It, it is very well uh, known to, to dry the skin out. If you're going through treatment, it's just going to be that much more drying. So you just have to be willing to either, you know, take the risk because you really love to swim and you're getting some benefit from the water, um, or to be overly zealous when you when you do your skincare and hydrate. Um, you know, in some instances, my son teaches swimming. He does not have cancer. He's not going through anything unusual with his skin, but his skin reacts so poorly that. He has to literally douse himself in an occlusive um, hydrator before he goes to teach class. Wow. So that's not going to be any different for somebody who's going through cancer and has really sensitive skin. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to answer all these questions today. We had a ton of questions, which meant you had a great presentation and it got people thinking about their own skincare and is it oncology safe? So thank you so much for coming with us today. Um, and participating with the Texas Oncology Foundation. 